Welcome back class. In this video, we're going to talk about sentinel controlled loops. A sentinel controlled loop is the other kind of loop. Previously, we've talked about counter controlled loops where the loop is controlled by some sort of counter variable that counts how many times the loop is iterated. In contrast, a sentinel controlled loop, also called an indefinite loop, runs a undetermined number of times. For example, we might have a program that asks the user to type a specific value when they want to end the loop. So a sentinel value such as y or n or negative 999 if we're working with numeric values is called a sentinel value. And sentinel controlled loops are set up such that they're going to look for that specific sentinel value and once that value is supplied either from the user or if we're, we're using some sort of other outside indication such as a value in a data row, when we encounter that value, we will end the loop. But we don't know ahead of time how many times that loop is going to iterate. So this is called a sentinel controlled loop and you can use the do while or the while loop in order to implement it. So let's take a look. This example is similar to one that we looked at in the counter controlled video, uh, but this is a sentinel controlled loop. The way this works is that we're going to ask the user for their name and we're going to say hello to that individual as we did before, but instead of iterating four times, we're going to keep looping, keep asking the user for their name and greeting them as long as the user doesn't type XXX. That XXX is a sentinel value. So if I type my name, it's going to say, hello, Sharon. And it will keep doing this until the user types XXX. Then we see the goodbye that's coming from this statement that occurs after the loop. So we see it after the loop terminates. So the thing to understand about sentinel controlled loops, as I said, is that they will run a undefined number of times it depends upon in this case when the user types xxx the other thing to understand is that sentinel controlled loops still have a loop control variable it's just not as obvious as the example where we had counter to control our loop if you look at this example and you look at the condition for continuation this loop continues as long as the name is not equal to xxx Therefore, name controls the loop. Name is the loop control variable. So for every well-formed loop, we have to ensure that it has all three requirements. The first is that the loop control variable is initialized before the loop begins. Unlike a counter controlled loop where we start count at zero or one, here we're allowing the user to supply a name, but that name value that the user types is used to initialize our variable name. The second requirement of loops is that we have a test that checks the loop control variable. Here we're testing that the name is not equal to XXX. And the last requirement of all loops is that we in some way update the loop control variable so that this loop doesn't run um, forever. So uh, an infinite loop. So the last step in this loop body is to ask for the next name. That ensures that by the time we get down here to the keyword loop and loop back around, we're now comparing that new name to XXX, and then the pattern continues. So that's a very simple example of a sentinel controlled loop. Um, you know, if you would run this program and type lowercase XXX, you'll find that the loop does not end because it's specifically looking for capital letters. One thing you can do to work around this is to use Visual Basic's built-in to upper method. By doing so, it will take the user's name as they supplied it, but it will uppercase it before it compares it to XXX. Nice little feature. Now, if I type lowercase XXX or a mixture of casings, um, the program will still end as desired. So let's take a look back at another familiar example. I'm going to pick on the payroll report. Payroll report from chapter five, if you recall, this program prompts the user to enter an employee name. And as long as they haven't typed XXX, remember that's the sentinel value, um, we're gonna go on to ask for gross pay. And then we do some calculations. So um, let's take a peek here. 
at the Visual Basic code. Here we go. Uh, we've seen this before, but let's look at it a little more carefully now. This program asks the user for the name before the loop begins, and that's essential because uh, if you recall, this loop ends when the user types XXX, so therefore name is the loop control variable. Every loop requires that we initialize the loop control variable before the loop begins. So here we get the first name from the user. Second requirement is that we compare that name to some sort of ending value. Now here they've used a constant called quit. And if you look up here at the top, it's declared and set to XXX. So it's really comparing the name value the user supplied to XXX. And the last thing in the loop is that we get the next value of the name. This ensures that the loop control variable is updated, just like our last example. The only difference between this and the previous example is in between time we're doing other things. If the user did not type XXX, then this will evaluate to true and will go into the body of the loop. In this case, the loop body does several steps. We get the gross pay, we read it in, convert it to a double. We're dealing with money here, so we're using the double data type. We do a calculation for deduction and net. Finally, we display all values for the user. So this particular program does more work in the loop body, but its underpinnings are still just another sentinel controlled loop. Let's take a look at another example. I'm going to run this one first so you can see what it looks like. It says enter L if you're left-handed, R if you are right-handed, or X to quit. I can tell by looking at that prompt that X must be our sentinel value because it's telling the user to type that value in order to quit the program. And I can test that out. It did in fact work and end the program. Let's try it again. Now if I type left for left-handed, yeah, okay, it's going to give me another prompt. So it's in a loop. We're going to keep, I typed left three times and right once. Now I'm going to type X to quit. Notice it gives us some feedback reflective of the input that we provided. I typed L three times and R once. So it calculated behind the scenes a total of the total left-hand students and a total of the right-hand students. So we're maintaining two totals. So not only is the program we're going to look at a sentinel controlled loop that iterates as long as the user has not typed X, it's also a program that accumulates totals, which is part of this chapter. A lot of times loops are used for this purpose. Now in this case, I can tell you by looking at the output that we don't just have one accumulator, in other words, one total, but we have two totals, one for the number of left-hand students and one for the number of right-hand students. So when we look at the program, it's no surprise that we have two integers that we start at zero because at the beginning of the program, our totals both start at zero. Those are going to be used to gather up. A, we're going to add one each time we get a new right hand or a new left hand input. We also have a variable here to collect the user's input. User is going to type something. We need a spot to store that value. We're calling the variable left or right. And because we're dealing with L's and X's and R's, that's a type string, not a numeric value. So again, this is a sentinel controlled loop. So we know that just like all loops, we have to initialize the loop control variable. If we step back from this a moment and think about it, the user's input is what's controlling the loop. So that's our left or right variable. So to initialize it, we need to do nothing more than just ask the user for that first value. Enter L if you're left-handed, R if you're right-handed, or X to quit, and assign it to our variable. The second requirement of loops is that we test that variable and make sure that it's not equal to the ending value of X. X here is our sentinel value. Now I notice in this example from the book, they put parentheses around the loop condition. You may have noticed that. In Visual Basic, it is considered optional to put parentheses around the loop condition. So some of the examples include it, some do not. Other programming languages such as C++ and Java do require it, so it might be something you think about adding to your programs. But that is our test. Do while left or right is not equal to x. 
Then we get into the meat of it. What is it we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to evaluate what did the user type and increment the correct total. So right now we're checking if left or right, which is the user's input, is equal to L, then add one to the left total, else add one to the right. Now this isn't foolproof. Um, you could try this out and type P and Y and any other type of input other than L, R, or X, and you'll notice that it will increment incorrectly the right total. So you could probably improve this by checking specifically down here instead of else, else if left or right is R. Right now, if it's not L and it's not X because we're inside of the loop body, um, we're going to increment the right total. But I just point this out as a limitation of this program. Um, if they type L or R, it's going to work correctly. And then we have to get the next value. So again, left or right um, is the loop control variable. Therefore, the third requirement of every loop is to get the next value or to update that loop control variable. So we repeat basically the same thing we did above the loop we do as the last step inside the loop body. Finally, after the loop ends because the user typed X, all we have to do is turn around and output the left total and the right total. So in this case, as I said, left total and right total are both accumulators. They're accumulating some sort of total. We have one more example of that kind of thing. This particular program deals with numbers. And it's similar to some of the other examples we've seen in the past. So I picked this one up. I added this one to our list of examples. I'm going to go ahead and run through it so you could see what it does. It says enter an exam score or negative 99 to quit. So negative 99 is the sentinel value. If the user types that at any point, the program should end, even if it's the first time through, and it does. But if we type something else, such as 100, the program tells me that the letter grade for score 100 is A. If I type 80, it tells me that's a B. 77 tells me that's a C. So we can see this output uh, being generated. We also can see that we're in a loop that keeps running until the user types negative 999. Let me go ahead and do that. So once I type that, this program goes a little bit beyond just showing us the letter grade for individual exam scores. We can see that behind the scenes, it was actually also accumulating a total that it used to calculate the average. The average across the values 180 and 77 is 85.6666. Now we can clean this up a bit and round this out. I'll show you how to do that. But that's the basics of this program. It asks for an exam score. If it's not negative 999, it calculates the equivalent letter grade, updates a running sum so that we can calculate the average. We're also going to update the number of exams because we have to keep track of how many exams we've collected. As we know, an average is the total of all exam scores, but divided by how many exam scores we got. So we're going to see another variable in the running here to keep track of how many exam scores we collected. So this is yet another Sentinel controlled loop. Uh, if you look up here at the top, we have uh, several variables. The first two are there so that we can get the exam score from the user uh, as a string. That's this guy here. Uh, input box always returns a string, so we're going to assign it to exam score string. This one is the final variable that we're actually storing the exam score in. Now, if we were collecting exam scores that could include a decimal point, we would have to modify this so that exam score was a double or another compatible data type. But we're going to say the exam scores the user pr is providing are all integers. Therefore, the variable sum is also an integer. Now, in this case, I didn't set the sum to zero. Um, in Visual Basic, the default value of every integer variable is zero, but I could explicitly state it as such by adding equals zero. When we calculate an average later in the program, we can get into some messy numbers. As we saw, 85.666 is not an integer, so average should be a double. We need a spot to store the letter grade that we determine for each corresponding exam score. So we're going to create a string variable for that. Quit 
set to negative 999 is just a constant we'll use to compare to the user's input. And finally, number of exams is an integer variable. We'll start it at zero, but each time we receive a new exam from the user, we'll increment the number of exams. That will be used later when we calculate the average. So if you step back from this a moment, you ask yourself, all right, what is the loop control variable? Well, when the program runs, if the user types negative 999 for the exam score, that ends the loop. So therefore, exam score is the loop control variable and is what we test here. So therefore, we know that we must initialize that loop control variable before the loop begins. So we see the steps to read in an exam score and convert it to an integer. Uh, just a sidebar comment here. Some of you may try a different approach where you read it into a string, but you don't convert it until inside the loop body. That would also work as long as you compare exam score string here to a string equivalent of negative 999. But we'll stick to this, this version here. We get the exam score, we read it in, convert it to an integer. That's our initialization step. The test step is do while exam score is not equal to quit. In other words, negative 999. If they would have typed negative 999 the first time through, it will skip over all of this logic and skip the loop entirely. In fact, I did that the first time through and it very quickly, briefly showed on the screen uh, that the average was um, NAN, which is an unusual and uh, perhaps um, unexpected behavior. You might want to add a little uh, logic down here that only displays or calculates the average if number of exams is greater than zero. But that's a little bit uh, of yet another way to improve this program. So let's take a look at how it is right now. If the exam score is not equal to quit, we go ahead and we add the exam score to the running sum. We increment the number of exams to indicate we've got uh, now one exam the first time through. Each time through, number of exams will grow by one. And then we look at that exam score. So here's some of our selection structure, decision structure logic from previous chapter, where we check and say, if exam score is greater than or equal to 90, set the letter grade to A. Else, if greater than or equal to 80, now remember, it's only going to do this check if it already failed the test for 90. So we don't also have to say, and exam score is less than 90. We can just check, is it greater than or equal to 80? If, then if it is, it's a B, and so on and so forth. The last option is uh, we've exhausted all the other possibilities, therefore the letter grade is an F. And finally, um, outputting the letter grade for score, echoing the exam score that the user provided back, is, and then we um, tell them the letter grade that they've earned. Notice each time through the loop, we will have a new value for exam score and letter grade is updated to the new letter grade earned by the exam score. The last step in the loop is to update the loop control variable. So we see really the same steps we saw before the loop executed to get the next exam score. Finally, if the user has typed XXX, we exit the loop and come down here to the bottom. I wanted to calculate the average based on the sum and the number of exams, so I divided the sum by the number of exams to arrive at the average. I wanted to output just a blank line so that when the, when the output for the average was displayed, there was an empty line of output before that output for average, so that's how I can do that. And then finally, display the average. The average across all exam scores is, and then we're going to display the average. If I wanted to, for example, uh, round that value off, I could say math.round parentheses average comma two close parentheses. This piece right here, math.round, will, will round out the average to two positions after the decimal point. So therefore, if we run it again with some values here, we can see that now it rounded off my um, final average output to just two positions after the decimal point.